should have a lot of uh, people clicking in by this time. So as I mentioned, uh, my co-moderators, uh, Dr. Dave Clements uh, from the Cooper Bone and Joint Institute in Camden, and uh, I've had the pleasure of doing this with Dave before, it's always a pleasure. And also a friend and a colleague, uh, Dr. Baron Lawner, uh, who's the chief at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York is gonna co-moderate this today. Next. Uh, our guest surgeon presenters uh, to make this truly international is uh, once again, friend and colleague, uh, Aaron Buckland uh, from Melbourne, Australia, and uh, my professional colleague, Kenneth Chung from Hong Kong. Next. Uh, the, the, the real highlights of this uh, are the patient presenters. And we are fortunate to have uh, all-star cast and uh, first of all, Grace, uh, Leah, and uh, Josette. So uh, I, I can't wait to, to hear, the, hear what they have to tell us. Next. So there's some instructions. Uh, only the presenter's audio will be on. All guests uh, should uh, mute their mic will be muted. Uh, if you're coming on and you're going about to speak, just double check that you didn't mute yourself uh, so that we don't have a, a long pause. There will be questions posed to the presenters by the moderator. Uh, the presenter will answer at the end of each topic. Uh, please submit feedback to us at the end of this. We really do uh, look into it and, and try and make each and every one better. Next. Uh, our agenda, my, my introduction, we're gonna talk a little bit about genetics and scoliosis. We try not to keep it too technical. Non-operative treatments, patient story one, fusion versus non-fusion surgical treatments, patient story, patient story three. And this will all provoke uh, a significant amount of discussion. Next slide, please. So setting scoliosis straight is uh, one of the uh, organizations I'm, I'm most proud uh, to be a part of. It's uh, established in 2008. It's a nonprofit 501c. Our mission is to discover better and advanced techniques in the treatment of scoliosis in both children and adolescents. And our vision is a future where children with scoliosis have the ability to live happy, healthy, and productive lives, uh, which I do believe most do today with, with good modern treatments. Next slide. So that leads me to introduce the co-moderator, uh, Dr. Lawner, who's gonna to talk to us about genetics and scoliosis. Baron, Thanks so you. much, Tom. Uh, it's great to be with our colleagues and friends, uh, and especially the families uh, from across the globe. Um, I'll talk today about genetics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, first, some basics. What is scoliosis? Well, the most common type is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and it is a genetic form of scoliosis. And fortunately, most patients don't require surgery. Um, uh, some will require a brace for curves that are worsening over 20 degrees in a growing uh, adolescent. And then uh, there are some new uh, uh, operative uh, options and alternatives that were not available even uh, five to 10 years ago, including non-fusion corrections. Next slide, please. So there's a, a whole list of possible causes of scoliosis. They're, they're listed here and we won't have time to go through them. But uh, again, the most common form is idiopathic and adolescent type. Next slide. And you can see 80% of all idiopathic scoliosis, the genetic form that we're talking about, uh, is, uh, has its onset in patients who are age 10 or, or older, but there's also juvenile or infantile uh, onset from birth to three and uh, age three to 10 for those categories. Next slide. And why do we treat scoliosis? Well, it does uh, have an impact on the quality of an individual's life, particularly for larger curves. We know that for uh, some patients, there's an impact on their sense of their, their body shape and self-image. Um, and in larger curves that were untreated uh, in childhood, the adults have uh, worsening curves, pain in some cases, and for larger curves, effect on uh, pulmonary or lung function. Next slide. And scoliosis comes in different shapes and sizes, so different severity, uh, magnitude or, or severity of the curve and different patterns, as you see here. Next slide. 
So it is a genetic condition. That is, it is passed on within families. And there's a concept called kinship coefficient. So a patient in Hong Kong or Australia uh, is, is more closely related genetically to a patient in New York or Miami, for example, who has scoliosis than to those who do not. And there's a, what we call an incomplete dominance pattern. We're, we're not doing a genetics class here, but we all have two sets of chromosomes and uh, this is a dominant condition. So in theory, if you inherit just the one, uh, one uh, chromosome with uh, the gene, then you would uh, develop scoliosis, but it doesn't always occur that way. And there appear to be multiple genes. It's called polygenic, multiple genes involved in this condition. And just because you have the gene doesn't necessarily mean that you'll develop uh, the actual uh, scoliosis itself. So it's variable penetrance, that's called. Next slide. So, and there may be environmental influences. And we know that uh, diet may have some effect and uh, exposure to uh, viruses may have some effect on genes. Uh, there are a lot of, of aspects to this that we don't understand fully. Uh, but also the likelihood of the curve getting worse progression uh, and the curve type is also likely related, related to genetics. Next slide. Um, I think we'll leave it there. I don't have really much time for the Mythbusters, except to say that uh, really most of you can uh, live a full, complete life with very little limitations in your activities uh, if you have scoliosis, whether it's treated surgically or with a brace or just milder curves that are observed. So I think we'll leave it there. And uh, um, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you and uh, we'll answer questions now as they arise. Uh, Michelle, uh, just uh, looking to see if there's any, uh, I don't see any coming up on my screen, but Baron, let, let me ask you a, a question. It, most of us have seen uh, identical twins where one has scoliosis of, of significance and the other one has very mild, if, if none. Um, so what does that speak to you in, in what you presented? Yeah, so uh, Tom, that's true. And we see often siblings, whether they be twins or not, or the children of a parent who has scoliosis may develop scoliosis and often not as severe or, or maybe it is more severe than their parent or their sibling. And some of that is uh, just that, that variable penetrance. It doesn't always show up in terms of what we call the phenotype, the actual presentation of the scoliosis, despite there being the genetics uh, material there in the patient, doesn't always show up as, as severe. So, um, uh, and there may be some differences in, in the genetics of, of identical twins, for example. There are going to be some differences and there can be spontaneous uh, changes in the genetics that uh, may account for some of that. It, it definitely, I, I like to say, is, is sprinkled through families. Uh, it, it's, I think that's the best way to, to describe it. Uh, Baron, why don't you introduce uh, Dr. Chung? Okay, well, it's a, a pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, Professor and uh, Dr. Uh, Chung, uh, who leads a, a, a very uh, prominent uh, center in Hong Kong and has been a leader in scoliosis care. And, and Dr. Chung is going to speak to us about non-operative treatment of scoliosis. Uh, Ken? Uh, thank you, Baron. Could you stop the screen sharing so that I can share my screen? Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to talk about a subject that I'm quite passionate about. And I've been asked to talk about non-operative scoliosis treatments and what's it, when is it indicated and, and how successful are they? I, first off, I'd like to acknowledge Charlene, who is a physiotherapist at uh, one of the hospitals I worked in that helped me put together some of the slides. Um, in Asia, um, other than the perhaps the more conventional exercises and, and braces that we use, there are other methods, uh, including soft braces, various forms of manipulations, and traditional Chinese medicine. I think right off the bat, I just want to say that there is no evidence 
that any of these really work. And so I'm not really going to talk about them in any great detail. <laughs> there is pretty good evidence that these do work, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about these. Now, first of all, I always feel that this is a very important slide to show um, everybody. And what this is essentially showing is that mild curves are very common, 10 degrees, 3% of the population, whereas severe curves are not so common. Um, you can see that, and, and I think by implication, it means that not every curve progress. And so that's something to bear in mind. We don't necessarily need to treat every mild curve. But having said that, there are a lot of people with mild curves or moderate sized curves, and we have to think about what's available to them uh, other than the perhaps more invasive surgeries. And so that's the bottom line. Not all curves progress and therefore not all curves require treatment. And that's something to bear in mind um, if you go and see your doctor. Um, you know, it's not, actually not a bad thing to be observed. Now, if it's mild, as perhaps shown on the left picture here, relatively mild, the effect on your body image is not very much. You may see a little bit of change in the shape and so on, but of course, if it's severe, it's much worse. And our job, I think, is that if mild curves stay mild and doesn't have much effect on the individual, then we don't actually need to treat it. And our job is therefore to really identify those that are going to mild, but are going to progress and treat those. And how do we do that? We do that by, by knowing the fact that in AIS, most curves, if they're going to deteriorate, will deteriorate during the growth spurts, when you grow fastest in your adolescent growth spurt. So, and, and so to some extent, it depends on the size of the curve when you first present, as well as whether and how fast you're growing. And we tell that by various methods, including when, if you're a girl, how, when your periods start, and various bone signs, what we call the RISA sign over the eyelid crest, or bone age, looking at the hand X-ray, as well as, of course, just simply measuring height. We know that when you're growing at your fastest, you're probably growing around six to eight centimeter in one year. So that would be close to your peak um, growth spurt. Now, bracing is probably the mainstay of treatment for mild to moderate size curves. Um, important to understand that it really only prevents progression and very rarely corrects the curvature. And that's why early diagnosis, while you're still growing, when you have a chance of progressing, and that's when we treat. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. There is, uh, and it, this, this slide is just to show you a very quick search that on a search engine that we use to look for scientific papers called PubMed. And you will see that there are 1,162 publications, scientific publications on bracing. So there's actually plenty of evidence that bracing works. And, and, and that is important because it's scientific evidence. It's not anecdotal evidence. Now, first of all, before we talk about science as such, how does this brace actually work? Um, and in essence, you will see that somebody has a curve, the brace put pressure on the spine and try to keep it as straight as, it, as the brace can within uh, and you know, with, with the spine within the brace as shown on the right picture here. And there are various types of braces that people use, including this Boston, a Boston type of brace, which is a tighter fit, or the Regal Chanel is also pretty popular nowadays, uh, where there are actually areas for the spine and for the body to kind of move into. Now, brace, I think it's important for everybody using a brace to understand that what I talk is, is kind of a growth mediated correction. In other words, if the spine is straight, it's growing straight. When, you, when your spine is bent, because of the pressure on the growth plate, it grows bent. It grows more and more bent. It becomes more and more, more bent as you grow. And so the idea of a brace is to keep it straight, as straight as possible, with pressure, as I showed you earlier, so that you can grow straight while you are at the time when you're growing fast. So that's the idea. And therefore, with that understanding, <coughs> the hours that you spend inside the brace is important. It's not you cannot wear it for two hours and expect it to work. And indeed, um, in this very important publication in New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, uh, in a randomized controlled trial, we showed that bracing time, the time in brace is important. So here is a chart which shows hours per day inside the brace and treatment success in terms of percentage. And you will see here at 17 hours or 18 hours, treatment success is close to 90%. Whereas if you reduce your brace wear to six to 12 hours, it drops down to 70%. So 
time inside the brace is important and something to bear in mind. Of course, we understand that it's not easy. Um, you can get abrasions. You can have problems, of course, with exercise, eating, um, and it's hot in you know, hot, humid weather like Hong Kong. It's difficult to wear it during the summer. Um, discuss these issues with your orthotist. We can try and help as best as we can and uh, do whatever we can to make you, to allow you to wear the brace for as long as possible. So it definitely is a team-based approach. We have orthotists, physiotherapists, of course, doctors, and very much so we need you and your family to help us make this a successful um, treatment. Now, common questions that we get asked in terms of bracing, when do we start? Well, moderate size progressive curves between 20 to 30 <coughs> degrees it would be a good time to start bracing uh, and to use it. When to stop when you finish growing? Um, because the brace really only prevents the curve from getting worse and the time that you are likely to, to progress is when you're growing fast. How long? As I mentioned, more than 80 hour, 18 hours, you get 90% chance of success. Keep it on for as long as possible. Um, which kind of brace? Uh, which kind of rigid or hard brace? Well, I showed you two, Boston and Rigo Chanel. There are really no comparative studies uh, to show you which one is better. I think, the, um, and so it's difficult for me to comment and, and uh, something that we can explore more in the question time. Now, moving on to exercises. Um, and in particular, I think nowadays is very much, uh, very popular around the world are so-called scoliosis specific exercises. Now, do they work and what can they do for you? Well, first of all, there is moderate evidence that they do work in some ways. And I show you a few publications here or, or good publications to show that there is evidence that they can improve the trunk shape in mild curves. And these, most of these studies are done in mild curves under 25 degrees. So you, by exercises, you're able to move your body in a way that you can improve the, the body image. Now, there's also evidence, and this is one of our own studies, to show that in combination with a brace, it actually helps to reduce progression. And um, so that is useful. And there's also some evidence that it leads to better core. In other words, the angle, the spine actually becomes straighter, uh, as shown in this publication here. <clears throat> Um, and indeed, in our own um, patients, we have a fairly large conservative treatment group of over now 500 patients that we've looked at, treated by exercise. And you can see uh, we've been measuring um, their cob angle over time. So this is cob angle, the angle that we measure on the x-ray over time, one, two, three, four, five, and six months. Uh, in essence, what we see is that with uh, scoliosis specific exercises, there is a mild drop in the cob angle, you know, 23 to 19 average. Uh, and we see that within two months of starting exercises, so it's not immediate. Uh, we see the largest effect by about three months. And if you maintain your exercises at home over time, that effect is at, at least maintained up to six months. I mean, we'll still continue to look at this um, in the longer term, but it's, it's, I think this is nice to know and nice to know that it can help you. So let me give you an example, 12 year old girl, noted to have a curve one year ago uh, from school screening uh, with a small cob angle and, and in her growth spurt really. And this is the curve that, was, uh, uh, that she has. You can see a 21 degree curve in the thoracic and 24 in the lumbar spine. That's the image with a slight asymmetry of the waistline as you can see here. She underwent exercise, and you can see that over time, there's a slight improvement in core angle, but I think perhaps more importantly, she's now able to maintain her, the symmetry better um, uh, without the need for bracing, uh, et cetera. So summarizing, when are they indicated? Well, a brace is indicated in moderate size curves of over 20 degrees, and if they suggest that they may progress. <coughs> Exercise is more controversial in terms of indications, but certainly mild to moderate size curves, they do seem to appear to improve appearance and may have a, have a role in um, improving outcome in braces as well as in, uh, um, as well as, as in mild curves. Uh, they should not be used alone. I would say that um, you should not use exercise alone in moderate size curves to prevent progression. Um, now, do they work? Brace, definitely, very good evidence. Exercise, 
mounting evidence of their usefulness. So I would also say yes, but I, I'm guarded in terms of using exercise alone. I think with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be very happy to answer any questions later. Thank Great. you. Uh, Ken, I, I don't see any uh, questions directed to you. So I'll, I'll ask a question clearly from what you've presented, particularly the BRACED study that was uh, sponsored by uh, the National Institutes of Health in, in the United States, uh, showed uh, bracing results are dependent on how many hours the patient wears the brace. So uh, if, if a patient wears the brace nearly 18 hours, there's a 90% likelihood of success. So what aspects of bracing today, modern bracing in your practice and others, uh, have allowed the patients to be more compliant, to wear the brace for longer hours? Are they more comfortable? How do they differ from the braces uh, of the past? Well, that I, I think there are various aspects. To me, um, the brace itself, as you mentioned, is important. We now try to use an all contact cast um, and brace so that there are no very big pressure pads to, to increase the pressure. I mean, the, the thing that stops people from wearing it are two aspects, uh, at least in our experience. One is, of course, is painful, potentially painful as you wear the brace, there's a lot of pressure. The second is it's very hot and stuffy. And I think the third issue is some people do not want their friends to know about their bracing. And so we try to tackle that from the orthotist perspective. We ask them to use all contact cards to reduce pressure over a specific area. Um, we have counseling, so we have psychological counseling, um, and we also teach them exercises out of the brace uh, as a kind of additional thing that they can do to help themselves. And of Great. course, I think from the doctor's perspective, we spend a lot of time explaining to them why they, to them and their family, why they need the brace and why they need to keep it on. Here's a question. Um, is Pilates mat work and or reformer exercises, so all Pilates, is that good for someone with scoliosis? How, how effective is that? How can that help? Well, I, I would answer it this way. Um, there's no good scientific evidence that it will help with um, preventing progression of the scoliosis. But I think all kinds of exercises on your back including Pilates and, and yoga and all these other exercises that you mentioned, are good for core muscles, are good for trunk muscles, so generally good for the spine. So I wouldn't stop you from doing any of these, but you just got to bear in mind that these are not going to replace, you know, if you're an adolescent and you're growing, it's not going to replace a brace. Okay. Um, one other question. We uh, could probably time. move on, Baron. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of people to talk yet. Perhaps there's time to, for it later. So, uh, and uh, Ken, you can look at the chat and answer there. So we're gonna go on now to uh, Grace, who's going to give us her personal story. We look forward to hearing from you, Grace. Thank you, I'll just share my Um, thank you so much for having me on this webinar and letting me tell a little bit about my story and how I've managed to embrace my scoliosis and become a professional athlete at the same time. Um, I'm very aware we're probably all on very different journeys here with different levels of severity, but I hope that maybe I can pass a few things on that I've learned in order to help someone else out there. I thought I'd just start a little bit by sharing a little bit about my background. Um, it probably wasn't until I was about 12 or 13 that it was officially acknowledged that I had scoliosis. Um, I grew up in a household with a sister who had quite severe medical issues. So even though I think we always knew there was something not quite right about the way I stood in my posture, it wasn't really high on my pro on our priority list to kind of really figure out what was going on um my parents did go through I was very I was always very tall and my parents did go through a stage of thinking that I was choosing to stand crookedly to hide how tall I was um but little did they know that I I literally to me I felt like I was standing dead straight but it was just always how it looked um 
And then when I started to get into sport was when I started to um, see medical professionals in order to get a feel and have a look at what was actually going on. And after doing some scans, I was told that I had scoliosis with an angle of 35 degrees. Um, but from doing more and more scans, it was holding quite consistent, which was good. Um, but I've also been very fortunate that because of my pain level and ability to live a normal day-to-day -day life, I've not had to have surgery or wear a brace. Um, and saying that though, like I've definitely had hard times when I've struggled with it. Um, and this is probably from a visual point of view and from being physically restricted by it. Um, but then when I discovered my passion for rowing, I knew that scoliosis was going to play a big part in my journey. And if I wanted to achieve my goal of winning a gold medal at the Olympics, I wouldn't be able to let these hard times sort of get the better of me. Um, I fell in love with rowing during high school and have been a professional rower for about the last 10 years since leaving school. Um, this year I competed in the Tokyo Olympic Games and came away with a gold medal in the women's pair and a silver medal in the women's eight for New Zealand. Um, it was definitely a very historic games to be a part of. Um, there were so many things about my Olympic journey that I still find quite hard to believe. Um, I guess the first one is competing at a 2020 Olympic games and 2021 is still, still a very strange, strange concept to me, but um, I mean, the main thing is that it happened and I'm very thankful for that. And then on top of that as well, being able to call myself an Olympic medalist is something I still find quite hard to believe. Um, and I never thought I'd probably really be able to do that anyway. And then to do it having scoliosis, which a lot of people would probably consider a barrier, sort of made it even more special. But I think looking back on my journey and considering like how how I got to where I am now, I think that my scoliosis actually, um, it, it almost attributed to me achieving my success. Um, it taught me so many important lessons along the way, which have helped both in my sport and in my life. And I think one of those main things is to focus on what I can control and not let what I can't control limit me. It's, I think it's very, very easy to be self-critical and focus on our own weaknesses. And I, that's, that's what I was doing for a long time in my rowing and probably being the um, typical self-critical sports person. I thought everyone around me was kind of judging me on the things that I couldn't do because of my back or just couldn't do as well as other people. Um, but I guess as I moved more and more through my sporting career and I got a little bit more confident, I realized that by focusing more onto my strengths and what I did do really well, um, it was a lot better tactic for me. And I think trying to make my strengths just so clear and so obvious, it, they sort of ended up outweighing everything else. And that's what I became known for. Um, and then I think it, scoliosis also taught me to be a real problem solver, which I think pays dividends in all aspects of my life. Um, rowing's a sport that it, it often takes a long time to reach your peak and achieve success. Um, and because I was constantly having to find slightly different ways of doing things to cater for the different way I moved in a boat and the different way I did things, um, I think it flowed on to being able to kind of handle any sort of hurdle that came my way and I think you know training for a games an Olympic games in a global pandemic I think that definitely paid dividends for me um I hope this brief overview of my story has sort of managed to kind of highlight some of my learnings and how I tried to use my scoliosis in a positive way um as I've moved through my sporting journey I think I've learned that I mean, scoliosis or not, everyone has quite unique things about them and it sets you apart. And if you can sort of try and embrace them and not shy away with them, I think you can always sort of make the most of every opportunity. Um, and I think the amount of people who reached out to me after the Olympics to tell me their story 
about scoliosis really blew my mind and it has made me really be proud to be a part of this community um and I think it's a very special one as well so I just want to say thank you for having me um and to setting scoliosis straight for setting up this webinar and it's yeah it's been amazing that's all that's just uh, tremendous. Uh, thank you uh, so much for sharing that with us. Um, I, I see people on the chats have talked about it being inspirational, but it, but it truly is. Um, you know, in, in, in my life of, of dreams that I knew I would never achieve, one was to play center field for the New York Yankees and the other one was to get, win an Olympic medal. So you managed to do the second one on my list. So congratulations to you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you, do you think that you have any right or left dominance in your sport related to your scoliosis or, or is that just myth up, a myth? I, I think I do, but I think that's quite a hard one with rowing because so I row with one horse, I row to one side. So in rowing, you naturally build up probably a more strength to one side so I think I've managed to find a sport that almost my dominant side should be my dominant side so it's sort of almost I don't know if it's an advantage but it really I've really like slipped into a very good sport for me but yeah I do I notice in the gym and weights I am more I'm a lot stronger on one side well I, th I think most athletes are yes that's uh, true. <clears throat> you know, a, a, a little known fact was that uh, Mark Spitz had a spinal deformity. He had Sherman's kyphosis and uh, it was theorized that perhaps his barrel chest uh, gave him some advantage in his winning his seven Olympic medals. But uh, I guess we really will never know that. Uh, we want to leave time for everyone here. So could we move on to the next speaker? Uh, and I'd love to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Buckland, who's coming speaking to us from uh, Melbourne. Uh, I first met Dr. Buckland when he uh, did a visiting uh, trip to New York City and uh, then uh, went on to uh, train him as a fellow and have him as a colleague. So uh, I've had uh, uh, great cooperation uh, and a lot of fun times with uh, Dr. Buckland. He's going to talk to us about fusion versus non-fusion treatments. Thanks very much, Dr. Erico. And uh, one of the nice things about a society of surgeons in scoliosis is exactly that, that we've been good colleagues and across the world and really uh, you know, broken down borders. So it's been great being able to work with you all over the years. So I've been asked to talk about, uh, really mainly here about the treatment decisions between fusion and non-fusion. And non-fusion is becoming more and more popular uh, amongst patient groups. There's certainly a, a large focus on it on social media. And so we get a lot of questions in the office about it. So we're trying to demystify a little bit around that. As we've already talked about, your surgical treatment of scoliosis occurs in these curves greater than 40 to 45 degrees. And, and there are, broadly speaking, the options of fusion or non-fusion. Uh, the non-fusion options are VBT or, or vertebral body tether or ASC, which stands for anterior scoliosis correction. What we're trying to do with surgery is number one, we, we want the progression uh, of the curve to stop. So we don't want it to get worse with time. We do wanna try and do just one surgery. We wanna correct the deformity and give what's called balance so that the head sits over the shoulders, the shoulders sit over the pelvis, pelvis sits over the feet. And we try and make sure that we keep our shoulders level, keep the waistline symmetrical and reduce some of the rib prominence. And we obviously wanna maintain as much flexibility as possible. It's better to have a balanced, flexible spine in many cases, rather than a completely straight stiff spine. So this is always a balance that we're trying to work out as surgeons. So when we're considering our planning, it, we need to consider where the deformity is, and it could be the thoracic or the lumbar spine, how big the deformity is, i.e. the cob angle you've probably heard of. And there's also looking from the side, what we call the sagittal plane, where it can be kyphotic or lordotic. And that's something you probably look at less on your x-rays. We wanna know how flexible it is, and the big key here is how much growth is remaining because this is us trying to predict years down the track what will happen while you're still going through growth in your adolescent years. You need to know what the goals of the 
individual person are. Do you want to become an athlete? Do you want a desk job? Do you want to do manual labor? This is very important to try and understand. And this is difficult for a lot of kids to know because a lot don't know that until they're about 16, 17 and, and looking at going to the workforce. So where's the deformity? You can see the, the mid part of the spine or thoracic spine is around the rib cage. And so these are people who tend to have more rib prominence that they'll notice. In the lumbar spine, you might see waistline asymmetry or people will say <coughs> one hip feels higher than the other, or you can have deformities in both regions. And we really just address the curve that is structural, meaning that not the one that you're compensating with. How big is the curve? Well, this is the Cobb angle. And uh, the Cobb angle is just a surrogate for, for in one plane here, but it's really a complex three-dimensional deformity. And you can see here, if you look from the top down, which is the image on the right, that there's actually a lot of rotation in the curve. So it's not just as simple as an X-ray and an angle in one plane. We are considering the curve in multiple planes here. When we look at flexibility, you, you, for anyone who's about to undergo surgery or has undergone surgery already, you remember we did these bending X-rays. This is so we can work out one, how flexible the curve is, but also which curves we actually need to treat surgically and which ones we, we don't need to treat. And this is the tricky part is how much growth remaining. So you've probably heard us talk to you about your RISA stage, which is where we look at the pelvis and see the bone growing across the top. Uh, and also we'll ask girls about the first period because there's, they, these are give us a guide as to how much growth remaining, but nothing's that accurate. So you've got to take them all as pieces of a puzzle. And as we've got more granular and, and we're looking at tethering now, we look at the Sanders stage and there's periods of rapid growth moderate growth and slower growth. And then when all of the bones in your hand have, have fused together, there's no growth remaining. So fusion really is the gold standard and was a long track record. Instrumentation's changed a lot over the years from the original Harrington rods to now very complex systems that we can change the spinal alignment in multiple planes. It still remains a long track record. It is successful and the revision rates are fairly low. It's not an evil. I think a lot of people in the adult world around spinal fusion have been pessimistic about fusion over the years and things have improved a lot, but in scoliosis, it's certainly not. We can correct the deformity straight away with a fusion. Uh, we've got a long track record and I would say for the vast majority of curves, this is still the best treatment when they get bigger than 45 degrees. Of course, there's some drawbacks. You do lose motion through the segments of the fuse and that's why we try not to fuse much of the lumbar spine unless we really need to, because that's a flexible portion. It limits growth in those segments. So we like to delay it as long as we can to not affect growth. Anytime you do a fusion, you can wear out the disc above or below, which is called adjacent segment disease. And very occasionally, if one of the levels of your spine doesn't heal, the rods can break or you can get pain, which needs more surgery. But the revision surgery rate is very low. And I saw Dr. Clements answer this before in the chat, but a 4.6 to 13% chance of needing another surgery in the next 10 years is pretty good. Non-fusion surgery or tether here re requires remaining growth to correct the scoliosis. So you get some correction at the time of surgery, but by tethering one side of it, you're trying to get it to grow back into a, into a straight spine on that anterior image. And this is a, an image that a lot of people like to put up with their scoliosis now showing flexibility. And tethering is has really been uh, more popular recently because people want quicker recovery. They want to return to sports quicker and they want to preserve motion. Originally, we were doing these just with uh, very specific curves, 35 to 60 degrees. They have to be flexible or bend out to less than 30 degrees. Uh, and the current in FDA indications in the USA really stipulate this. You can do it for thoracic or lumbar spine. You have to have failed non-surgical treatment and you have to have significant growth remaining, but not too much. But we're starting to see an expansion of these indications. And this is really an area that we don't understand so well. And those are people that have almost stopped growing or stopped growing people with really big curves or rigid curves, and sometimes taking out some disc to correct that is, is required, uh, and curves that are less than 45. And I would caution the less than 45 because you're making a non-surgical problem a surgical problem potentially. There are some disadvantages. Correction does occur over time, so you don't get that instant gratification of the correction. There's no long-term results as yet. Uh, and, and we're really seeing that a lot of people are needing multiple surgeries. And this is a 30% risk by two years. So you can see the risk of needing another surgery is significantly higher than if you have a fusion. It's not to say it's not as good, but it's only required for very uh, mm -hmm. suitable patients. And you've got to be strict about who you do them for. Rib prominence and growth potential, obviously very important in these groups. And this is an example from Dr. Ahmed Alane in, in Turkey showing that the scoliosis changes over time with remaining growth. So the important thing here with a tether is you need growth remaining 
but not too much growth because then it can grow back the other way and get overcorrection. And the tethers also can break if there's a lot of motion remaining. Now, if that's that may not be a problem if you've corrected your scoliosis, but if you've got little growth remaining and they break, you can lose some of the correction. And you can see a close up there, the spreading between the screws when your tether breaks. The best outcome is a flexible spine. We're not going for full correction. Uh, anything under 35 degrees, maintaining motion is, is a win in this space. And the difference here between ASC, which you'll hear about versus tether is really that you don't have as much growth remaining with an ASC. Fusion, good long-term results here versus tethering. Uh, you do lose some range of motion, although not a lot if you don't go low into the lumbar spine. And you're probably a bit later to get back to your regular activities, although we see many patients living happy, normal lives, doing all the regular activities they would want to do after a fusion. So the important part here in working out who and who to do these surgeries for is uh, reporting our outcomes, reviewing it with our peers, and setting scoliosis as a straight foundation and harm study group have been really working very well to try and answer these questions for us. So which one's better? Well, I would answer neither. I mean, you, you really need to do the right surgery for the right person and the right curve. This depends on the doctor's experience, what the evidence base shows, for which patients are more suitable, and what the individual preferences and requirements for that person are. So this is a complex equation. One size doesn't fit all. This is a picture of me from my high school prom on the right, thinking my dad's suit would make me look smart. But you can see that you can't apply one thing to everybody. Same as when Dr. Erico lent me his car, it probably wasn't a good idea to take it on the beach. <laughs> so in summary, Planning for scoliosis correction is a complicated decision. We, we rely on uh, looking at curve size, location, flexibility, and how much growth remaining there is. There are several ways to correct the curve and no one size fits all. So this is really an important conversation between patient, surgeon, and family. Fusion still remains the gold standard and has a long track record and safety profile. Although tethers and anterior scoliosis, scoliosis correction are, are new techniques that have some benefits in selected patients, but we still need to study this for longer. And thanks very much to all of our partners uh, with setting scoliosis straight. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, nicely presented. I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A function. Uh, I have a quick one, Aaron, if it's okay. Please, Tom. It's, it's a little left over from uh, Ken's talk as well, but it fits both. I'm going to paraphrase Mia on the line, uh, talked about how she was uh, upset uh, or disappointed to understand that her curve wasn't picked up until she already had a 70 and a 50 degree curve. How unusual is it? We talk about ideally uh, catching patients early enough to either brace or tether, but um, is someone really dropped the ball or, or do curves sometimes just progress that fast in a growing child? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I, I think some people hide it better. You know, you're very tall, slender, slim people. It shows up more easily. Uh, people don't know they're looking for it quite often. They'll say one leg looks longer. They don't realize it's a scoliosis and maybe it doesn't click as if there's not a positive family history. And another thing we've noticed through COVID is now we're not going on our vacations to the beach and sitting around the pool and, 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 and curves often get noticed in kids at these events like at gymnastics, at sports or on family vacations. So I, I think we're seeing a little bit more of this during COVID. I don't think anyone's dropped the ball. I think there are some curves that progress quickly, but uh, some people hide them as well. It's, it's not so obvious. I, I think they, they just uh, come very fast. Um, I think we, uh, uh, is there maybe one other question here? Uh, 32 degree, 12 year old boy. And then we're going to answer this uh, relatively quickly, Aaron, so we can move on to, to stay on time. 12 year old boy, 32 degree lumbar curve and 20 degree thoracic. Surgeon is advising fusion. Will this stop his growth? Is this too soon? 32 degree lumbar curve and a 12 year old. Yeah, that's a little smaller curve for, for me to consider fusion. I, I think this could, I would try bracing. I would, I would try not to operate on this type of curve because the lumbar spine, you need to keep flexibility, but also people can live happy, productive lives with a 32 degrees curve if you can keep it there. <clears throat> so I would really be encouraging bracing at this point and, and, and close monitoring 
that if it did get beyond 40, 45 degrees, you would consider fusion in and fuse as few levels as required to correct the curve. Great. Let's go on to the next uh, talk. And we have Leah, who's uh, going to tell us about her story, Leah. Hello, everyone. Let me get my slideshow up. Okay, so I am so excited to be here and to be recently named a spokesperson for Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. I am really excited to share my story and in return, um, hope to inspire others to share their, their stories and to know that they're not alone throughout all of this. So a little bit about me is that I'm currently Miss Florida 2021. Um, and so I will compete at Miss America this year in December. It's the 100th anniversary of Miss America. So I hope you can all watch on December 16th. And in the Miss America organization, you do have to have a talent portion. So my talent is dance. I've been a dancer since the age of three. But something most people don't know is that I did have scoliosis and underwent spinal fusion surgery at the age of 17. So I'm going to share my story with you all today. So I mentioned I've been a dancer since the age of three and just love the art of dance and being able to express myself in the dance studio and um, just kept that up as I grew up and could really see myself continuing to perform and have dance more than just a hobby in my life. So one day when I was in eighth grade, uh, well, I'll rewind a little bit. We actually did have a scoliosis screening in my middle school back in sixth, seventh grade, and I passed with flying colors. So never thought that was an issue. But in eighth grade, I think I underwent a pretty big growth spurt. And I was actually getting ready to go to dance class. And I had my leotard on. And my mom actually came up from behind and she said, why is your right shoulder blade sticking out more than your left one? And so she came up to my back and tried pushing it in. And she was like, it's not going in. I don't know what's wrong. It just looks a little off. And I didn't think much of it, never felt anything wrong with my body or felt off in any way. But at my next visit with my pediatrician, we brought it up to her attention and she made me bend over, do the scoliosis screening. And she pretty much confirmed that it looked like I did have a slight curvature in my spine and referred me to all Children's hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida, where they had specialists for scoliosis. So from there, it was confirmed that at the time, um, when I was graduating eighth grade, going into high school, I had a bit over 20 degree curvature in my spine. So we decided to be proactive and we decided to get a brace, which I do still have with me and wanted to show if you can see it. It was pink snake skin. So I thought it was very trendy at the time. And I didn't want to get rid of it. One, because I didn't know what to do with it, uh, because I can't just give it to someone else because it's custom made to me. And I also kind of see it as a symbol, symbol of what I went through. So it reminds me of my journey. So I had a night brace for a few years that I would sleep in every night. Um, and I'll be honest, it wasn't easy. It wasn't comfortable. It, you know, bracing myself in every night to get into bed was not enjoyable, but I knew that it was something that was going to help along the road. And we were trying to be proactive. Unfortunately, it didn't quite help as much as it, it would have been great to. Uh, so my degree did keep progressing. And by the time I got to my junior year of high school, I ended up having a 63 degree curvature in the thoracic part of my spine and a 42 degree lumbar curve. So we decided at the time that it would be necessary to have spinal fusion surgery after discussing it with my family and my doctor. Um, and that was the best option for me. It did become painful at the time. As you can see, my ribs on the right side of my back did start expanding and the rotation was really causing my ribs to protrude where I was having a bit of a hump that became visible on, on my back. So going into my senior year of high school that summer, 
that was when we decided to have my spinal fusion surgery and it was exciting, but also terrifying. And I was very nervous. And so being a dancer since the age of three, my first question to my doctors before surgery was, will I be able to dance again? It's a huge passion of mine. And I'm really scared that I can't, I'm going to have to stop dancing and I have no control over this situation. And something I really admired in my doctors, um, and especially my Dr. Neustadt, he's at All Children's Hospital, he's very transparent with me. And he said, this isn't going to limit you uh, from being able to dance in general, but to be honest, it's going to take away a lot of your flexibility and you're going to have to work really hard if you wanna to touch your toes and be able to still move and be flexible. So because I had two curves in the thoracic and lumbar part of my spine, essentially the goal was to fuse my entire spine from top to bottom. Luckily, when they did go into surgery, they realized that my spine was pretty flexible from my years of dance and um, strength training, that when they did move the top part of my spine and fused it, the bottom part corrected itself for the most part. And luckily they didn't have to fuse my entire spine, which was an incredible blessing. And so this is the post-op picture of the scar after surgery. And I was in the hospital for about five days in total. Um, I had, was hooked up to a lot of IVs. I was on a morphine pump on some very serious drugs uh, to get me through the pain. And I had a great treatment in the hospital, was treated um, incredibly well by the staff and really loved my time in the hospital, eating pancakes, drinking slushies and having the bedside care 24 seven. But I will say that when I did go home, it was quite an adjustment to recover. So there were about six, you know, the remainder of my summer and then going into senior year, six months where I really couldn't do physical activity. I had to be really careful if I decided to drive in a car because you never know what could happen. Um, and the hardest part for me that I found was getting comfortable and trying to fall asleep after surgery because it wasn't easy and I was taking the drugs, uh, you know, around the clock to try to get through the pain. But luckily I had a great support system with my family and some medical um, people in my family that really could help me throughout the process. And I got through it. Um, but before surgery, I really did think that my dance career was over. And I thought that this long-term dream of becoming Miss America and dancing on the Miss America stage probably wouldn't happen because although I might be able to move and dance, it wouldn't be at the same level that I really expected after years of training since I was three years old. And I didn't know if there really was a future for me in this area of my life. So it was quite devastating for me to be very <laughs> and disheartening to see that these dreams probably weren't going to come to fruition after this, but this was a situation that I simply couldn't control and spinal fusion was necessary for me. But through the help of my doctors and discussing that I really didn't want to give up on my goals and I was very persistent and persevered through the pain and very dedicated that I still continued to dance and I um, still had these passions and dreams I didn't want to give up and I knew that if I could work hard, I could achieve them no matter what I went through. So I remember going into my first dance class after recovering the best that I could, and I took some time off. So the class had been, you know, taking classes and I was missing out on a few, but I decided to go and take it easy and take it step by step. And I went in with the mindset that I'm going to be the best that I can, but I'm also quite a perfectionist. And after having years of training, I really thought, you know, I can still kick my leg up in the air and do all these things. I can recover pretty fast. Well, about 15 minutes into the class, I was beyond frustrated. A lot of my flexibility was hard to, to regain. And I quickly realized that I was, it was going to take some time to learn how to dance again with my new back, essentially. Uh, but I worked really hard with my instructors and personally taking extra time to make sure that I was recovering in a safe way. Um, but knowing that I could still dance again, and it's not about having perfect technique, but still having the ability to move and pursue my dreams. 
So it has been quite the journey for me. And I actually worked really hard, made the dance team at the University of Florida where I attended and graduated this past May. Um, in June, I was crowned Miss Florida where I danced as my talent and will now compete at Miss America. And um, I'm actually dancing to Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. If you heard of that, it's become popularized through Bohemian Rhapsody recently. Uh, but it's really my message to America that no matter what you've been through, if you've dealt with scoliosis, you've had spinal fusion, or you have any sort of roadblock in your journey, that don't let these roadblocks stop you from pursuing your passions and your dreams. So it's been a full circle moment for me now to be a spokesperson for this organization. Um, and I want to say that through my high school years, dealing with this roadblock and having spinal fusion, I was pretty ashamed. And I was, I was not very vulnerable with my peers. I actually hit it and I maybe had two friends that knew that I even had spinal fusion surgery. Um, and I really kept it a secret because I was ashamed of my scar and what I'd been through. And I thought, I thought it made me lesser than my peers. And so being here now, I've learned that being vulnerable and sharing my story has actually been an incredible thing. And as Grace mentioned too, I've had so much feed, positive feedback from people saying, my daughter has scoliosis or I had spinal fusion and your story inspired me to not give up on my dream and to still well, go. Uh, and on, on that note, Leah, that was fantastic. And, and we're so happy to have you as our, our one of our spokespeople uh, persons and and it's really been terrific. We are uh, and you're going to uh, be able to share your story. I hope many times uh, with uh, many different groups. I think we probably need to move on to our our last um, our third patient as well because uh, we're running into time. So Josette, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, why don't you tell us your story, please? Okay. Um... Please stop screen recording. Oh, I'm sharing. Sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Josette, and I'm very glad to be here to share my scoliosis journey. This is the table of contents for today's presentation. Please feel free to ask me questions after my sharing. So why am I here today? Thank you, Professor Jering, for the wonderful surgery that you did on me, so I can be a loving proof of someone who fully recovered from scoliosis after the surgery to be here today to share my own personal story. I hope my sharing can benefit some of you here in this call on how to take care of yourself physically and mentally during your process. So a bit about myself. I am 12 years old. I was diagnosed with idiopathic scoliosis at the age of 10 when I went to the yearly health checkup. Last, last October, I underwent an eight hour surgery to fix the curve of my spine. I am the 11th person in Hong Kong who operate on a new surgical, surgical approach called VBT. VBT is a form of scoliosis surgery that aims to preserve spinal mobility that um, a lot of doctors have said just now. Um, looking back now, my family had made the best decision for me and I can move freely now. My upper curve was already 46.2 degrees when first diagnosed. The one and a half year of bracing and physiotherapy did not slow down a deterioration of my scoliosis. My upper curve worsened quickly in a short period of time and went up to 58 degrees before my surgery. You can all look at me now and know that the operation went really well. The upper curve came down from 58 degrees to 20 degrees post-surgery. In the last follow-up appointment, the reading even came down to 17 degrees and the curve in my spine will continue to improve as I grow. There was a lot of uncertainty and hardship during the treatment phase. It was not an easy 1.5 years wearing the brace. During that time, I moved to a new school and was worried that how others might perceive me in a new environment. The physical changes of puberty as well as a brace made me want to hide. I still remember I slouched my shoulders and tried to cover the brace with oversized t-shirts. The brace also limited my body movement. I had to give up on playing ice hockey, which I was really, really passionate about because I've been playing it for more than six years. 
Um, fixing the curve with surgery was a huge thing for me or for any other 11 year old. I had to skip school for a few weeks and thank God the surgery went really, really well. And I only stayed in the hospital for a few days after surgery and I am now fully recovered. I realized how lucky I was to have such a wonderful care that it got for me, my diagnosis, surgery, and recovery. Remember, if you have scoliosis, you are not alone in this journey. We have professional teams out there to help. All you need to do is to take action promptly because the window of time to get the best results from surgery is not always wide open. Rather, it depends on many factors, so don't delay it. Seek medical advice. I am very glad to see that you have already taken the first step to join today's call. My last take home message for you. It is not necessary to hide your curve, your brace or the scar after your surgery. Be inspired by the examples of the famous people in the next slide who also suffered from scoliosis. Just be confident and take the best care of yourself. I hope to hear your story at the next Setting Scoliosis Straight meeting. Thank you for listening. I, well, that was fantastic, Josette, as well. And I really would say that the highlight of this meeting has been the three uh, ladies who shared their story with us. And uh, I wish we had more time <coughs> together to go through, uh, you know, your, your inspiring stories and how you have coped with having scoliosis and, and going through uh, your treatment. Um, but thanks so much for sharing with us. Um, I, I think time doesn't permit uh, any further questions, but I do have a, a couple of uh, points to make. And that is that uh, we really appreciate uh, all of you uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, Rim for, for attending this uh, meeting. We hope you found it uh, informative and helpful. And if you do appreciate this event and, and future events like it, this will be in our uh, in the archives of our uh, website, settingscoliosisstraight.org. Um, and you can access this and other uh, content as well. And we would really appreciate uh, if you felt this was valuable, uh, a donation uh, to the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. You can do that through the website or by texting scoliosis uh, and the information <coughs> there or through Amazon Smile. Again, this information is in the website. Um, next slide. I'd like to uh, shout out a, a special thank you to our sponsors who made this event possible. Uh, they're all listed here and we do appreciate their support uh, over the years. Um, please uh, all look out for our next uh, webinar on December 2nd on vertebral body tethering, which you've heard some of that today. And we'll go into more depth uh, in, on December 2nd. So thank you all for attending. This has uh, been a, a great uh, a time uh, with you.